Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Hello, how are you? Hey. Huh. hey, how are you? Wonderful. Yay. So for those in the audience who are unaware, next we have Mikester. Um, probably best known for being the socialist who bugged the shit out of everyone in the Libertarian Party. And to, you know, um, and I don't know what I, I mean, you've done, it feels like you've been involved with every other leftist caucus within that party and now moving and now are thankfully moving on to bigger and better things. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to talk about that today. So thank you awesome. for inviting me here today. Yeah, definitely. Well, I will let you take it away. <laughs> thank you. All right, so um, so thank you, Logan, for inviting me on today. And I've been really, um, it's been really enjoyable to kind of see and hear the different people that you've had speaking so far and to watch Coup de Gras grow into um, here in its second annual iteration. Um, the digital, like, it's just, it's amazing to watch what you've done and you are one of my inspirations um, for my work. So first of all, just thank you for putting all of this together um, and just remind the viewers that you do have a legal defense going on and like you need a lot of money for that. So um, if you all can help her with that, please do. Um, my talk today is titled, You Can't Sit With Us Beyond Bottom Unity. So the You Can't Sit With Us thing is a Mean Girls reference, which is kind of like a pop cultural um, you know, reference point that 
is an inside joke to some of the people of us who've been doing this work in the libertarian party bond immunity of course You've probably heard of it. I will explain a little bit more. Um, the subtitle here is Exploring Themes of Justice in the Shadow of Lent. So, of course, this is a Mardi Gras festival, uh, which is, you know, it's a celebration of the fact that in the Christian tradition, um, especially the Catholic one, um, but others as well, um, the, the season of Lent is upon us. So I'm going to kind of pick up some different themes there. Um, and kind of contextualize them in the in the in in the like frame of justice, right? Because I'm thinking about it a lot lately um, in terms of like what does society look like when justice isn't based on a demand, but like when it comes from inside of us, right? Like what is the transformation necessary to get us from where we are to where we we're hopefully going, right? So I'm going to start with a content warning um, because I am going to be picking up themes out of Christianity. Um, and I typically, like, I think one of the really important things for someone practicing the dominant faith in the U S right now, um, is to like continuously be kind of sabotaging the idea of Christian supremacy. It's not the only faith system in the world and not everybody in the world needs to have a faith system, much less the specific one. And, um, that error in reasoning has been used to justify a lot of colonialism and, and you know, just heinous crimes over the centuries. And um, I want to be really sensitive about that. And I'm careful in a lot of my work to really couch my language in conditionals and to try to mute the the idea that, you know, because it like there is a kind of normalizing effect when your thing is the dominant, you know, paradigm, even even though it's so twisted out of shape by, you know, what, what gets presented as the political version of that. Um, so normally like I'm really careful, but like today I'm about to have like a super vulnerable moment and stuff. So um, rather than like kind of, um, you know, later on have to continually like mute what I'm saying, like, I'm just going to be myself. And um, so I wanted to put that like content warning up front. I'm going to assume that my audience is okay with like me sharing how my spirituality relates to how I think about justice and in particular how I use it myself to um, hopefully become more transformed over time. And um, yeah, so there's that. The other thing is I am a survivor of addiction and um, I may use um, personal stories from my past. It depends how I'm doing on time. If I do that, there will be um, discussion of child abuse and hate violence. Um, and so if that would be difficult for you, um, I'm not going to, not going to hurt my feelings. If you, you know, turn it off, come back later, watch the replay where you can pause it if, if you need to, or, you know, just, just check out like whatever boundary is right for you. Like, please. Um, and the final little content warning is that like, I was originally going to use a personal story from my past, which is why I don't know if I'm going to come back to it now, but it is kind of relevant. So we'll see. But um, this week, um, a, a, a like conflict like emerged uh, in real time that it really makes a really good case study for like how this work can help us um, unpack the conditioning that we live with like in real time. So um, I wasn't sure whether to use it or not because like it is an active conflict. Um, that could be touchy, but I just decided that like, you know, God's timing is perfect. And, um, this is the example that was put in front of me. And so it's a gift to us and a gift to you all and content warning, because I realized framing that as a gift before <laughs> I, I've like done any illuminating work around it. Like with my talk is probably going to strike us a little hollow because we've been going through a lot of conflict with it. So, um, sometimes it doesn't feel like a gift in the moment. And in fact, um, if we don't do like liberating work inside ourselves with it, um, they can just turn into more trauma and harm over time. And so that's like what I want to unpack here and talk about. So content warnings out of the way. Um, I'll do a personal introduction. Um, as Logan had mentioned, I am probably most well known for my work with the Libertarian Socialist Caucus in the Libertarian Party and um, the sort of rallying call around that that is known as bottom unity. So bottom unity is like, if you think about that uh, political chart, the bottom half of it 
is the libertarian half. So it's the idea mm -hmm. that people who are of, a, you know, a libertarian tendency uh, of whatever, whether it's ANCAP, ANCOM, anything in between, um, we have a shared um, desire to dismantle the state and the, the state is a giant, like that's a big project. So it, it, we need a lot of help with that. And we all benefit from um, sort of setting aside our preferences for a post-state world or our economic preferences anyway, and focusing on um, reducing the amount of violence um, to zero if possible together. Um, there is a tactical value for that in terms of uh, like just the, the mainstream political system, which seems to be veering into, you know, fascist territory. Um, the Libertarian Party does have ballot access. QAnon is politically homeless, depending whether the Republican establishment is capable of like shutting down um, Donald Trump or whether he winds up, you know, getting a second bite at that apple, whatever. Um, the Libertarian Party is a loaded gun on the table that anyone can pick up. And in a time of right-wing populism, that's pretty dangerous. So if we can hold that uh, political entity accountable to um, classical libertarian values, the ones that it nominally claims to stand on, then um, we have a better chance of at least making sure that particular gun doesn't get picked up. So there's an anti-fascist value there too. Um, I'm actually doing a panel later today with other members of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. So we'll probably come back and, and talk a little bit more about that work then. Um, and I'm also doing a panel tomorrow with Logan um, about um, faith and Christianity um, for queer activists. So um, we may dig deeper into a lot of the like spiritual aspects of like that. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on kind of like so because I am a survivor of addiction and my like the whole higher power thing came to the forefront for me in that context. Right. And there's, it isn't just you go and sit in, you know, a recovery meeting and start saying, Oh, I love God now. And God loves me. And you magically stop being an addict. That's not how it works. There's actually like a series of activities that you do. So like you dig into the darkness and the trauma of your past you figure out what those resentments are so that you can look at them and do something with them, let them go. And then you do an amends process, which is to kind of restore the relationships with the people that you've caused harm to. And that work is what digs out like all of the pain that was leading to, like for me, my drug of choice was crystal meth. And I have some pretty deeply rooted uh, traumas over the years. And, um, eventually crystal meth was the way that like I was able to like stop, like it was the only thing strong enough to kill the pain and I didn't really have any other tools. So that is a common thing. So like, that's how that piece of this works for me. So um, what I'm going to share with you is how I use those tools over the years. I learned that they aren't just helpful for addiction. They're particularly relevant in the context of restorative and transformative ideas of justice what would a post-state world look like if we didn't have courts and judges and police using violence to um, try to fix things that uh, really need to be like handled from the inside, right? And like we often have that question, well, what about the serial killers? What about the bad people? How do we help them? Um, well, you know, state violence doesn't help them. It never set anybody free. It didn't set me free. Um, so let me stop and talk about the Lent thing real quick, because there's like a, a, a lesson in this story that I think is helpful for anti-capitalist and anarchist work. So the, there's kind of two really overarching narratives of Lent. I'm just going to focus on one, which is this idea that um, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days in the beginning, of, like right before his ministry was going to start. <sighs> And he was tempted by the enemy and the enemy told him to make bread because he was hungry. And Jesus was like, no, so think about that. Like bread, like the idea that um, the struggle basically for food, just for food in a world where access to food is treated as a privilege. Um, 
that kind of struggle over a survival resources is a temptation. It's a temptation to domination of other people. And if there's anything that represents what it looks like when people, um, you know, are trying to hoard all the bread to themselves so that um, they can make sure that they've got the bread, who cares if anybody else has enough? It's capitalism. The second temptation is like he, he says, here's, here's, here are all the cities, here's all the wealth and power of the world, and I can make it yours. So wealth and power, which are means to the end of dominating all the bread so that you get to keep it for yourself, right? That's a temptation of the enemy in this story. And the third one is um, he gets taken up on the temple and the enemy is like, you know, fling yourself down. You're special. God will save you. And, you know, oh, okay. So I guess my crony connections and the fact that I'm special makes me like, I get to take risks with impunity and, you know, it's another temptation, right? It's possible to construct a system where um, I'm protected from risks and I get to steamroll other people. And anyway, I don't want to dwell too much on it or like, you know, over like um, analyze the metaphor, but there's something else going on in this story, which is what I'm trying to get at. Right. So we like, we can take this cue from like that. It's like these, if you think about it, like underneath it all, like wanting bread to eat is a good thing. Wanting like safety and security, wanting to be protected from things like falling off the temple, right? Like wanting to be safe is actually a good thing, right? And setting aside the like money and power aspect, like simply wanting to be, you know, prosperous and empowered, even that is a good thing, right? So the lesson like I see there is not so much that like our human desires are inherently like, you know, flawed. It's that when they get our temptations that take us beyond merely what they are into a place that would be harmful, then we've got a problem. And so what I'm trying to get at is that those impulses actually come from inside. I see when I look at it that way that the problem isn't just capitalism or statism or some other ism outside myself. It's not just what other people are doing as they clamor for bread and safety and money and power. It's also what I do when I'm caught up in a struggle for you know food, money, shelter, whatever it is, right? Because we're living in this kind of situation where the violence has been normalized for so long that it's taken for granted. And um, when I get to the stories I'm about to tell, you can see that like, when I really start to unpack it, I can see that it doesn't matter how woke I am, like on an academic level, um, I can still have a cop inside me. I can still have an abuser inside me. I can still have a gay basher inside me. And it's so important in the story, even, you know, if the call is to be Christ-like, right? To place love for neighbor above all other concerns. Um, that I learn how to overcome the temptation to clamor for those things in a way that harms others and that manifests a world that looks more like the enemy than a kingdom of God, which when I say kingdom of God, just substitute the phrase luxury gay space communism. And you have the idea of what I'm talking about there. So I'll move on because we're not here to like analyze scripture. We're just here to kind of learn about justice in Mike's interesting way. So you get the point, right? We have to go inside. And that's a lot more difficult than learning a vocabulary of social justice and using it as a weapon or learning a vocabulary of anti-capitalism and, you know, leaving comments about it in, you know, in under right wing pages so that like, you know, I can own the ANCAPs or whatever it is, right? Like, um, that's great. And the wisdom that can flow from that by like being surrounded by the speech and the analysis that will help me understand how the clamor for, you know, food and money and shelter and all of those things is 
um, fueling the conflict that we experience. Um, I literally just lost my train of thought because I'm trying to segue to my next point, and I hope so. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pause and not do a segue. I'm just gonna start with my next outline point. So we see that a kind of justice needs to come from my side. So I think I'm gonna stop, but I'm gonna tell my two little like disturbing like childhood stories as they're part of like the conflict that erupted this week. And let's start with the first one. So content warning, child abuse here. So, My father used physical violence to, as a weapon of control. He spanked us with a belt and I was the oldest. So I took the brunt of that. Um, he learned, I think over the years that that wasn't right, but he also, you know, is a product of a Midwestern upbringing and Years later, when I unpacked it all, I kind of was like, I realized that the look of kind of grim, um, like I, when, when this abuse was happening, I started noticing that I saw like a kind of pleasure on his face. This is hard, so just work with me. Like he would be spanking me and I would be looking at his face and I would see this kind of, he liked it. And remember, I'm like, I'm a kid, so... I don't have a lot of analysis to go by, but I did notice that. So I noticed that I could, I could take that joy away from him by pretending it didn't hurt. So um, what I now like in, as an adult with a lot more history and understanding, I can realize that like he was raised that way. He was raised to believe that you do your son a favor when you, um, <clears throat> when you teach him discipline. Um, and so what I was perceiving as pleasure was a kind of cope, almost like a grim resolve that like, this is really disturbing to me, but it has to happen. And that doesn't make it okay. Like that's on the side of, of, of that's on his side of the street. And, you know, we're, we're fine now. We, I, we've done all the amends and all of that. So it's fine. Right. But at the time, here's what I just want to like focus on is that like, I observed that I could take that joy away from him by pretending he didn't hurt. So I would try so hard because like, that was the trigger for him when I started crying and finally I would be broken. I would be like, just stop. I won't do it again. Like then he didn't have to do it anymore. So he would stop spanking me. But like, for some reason I decided to focus on denying him the joy. <laughs> so I would, the result of that is that he would spank me harder and harder trying to get me to admit that what I did was wrong. And all I was learning is to associate um, pretending it didn't hurt with triumph. So to overcome an oppressor, I pretended they, you know, they don't. I, anyway, I don't want to dwell too much deeper on that. But my point is to share that trauma that was inside of me. And then the second story I'm going to tell, content warning, hate violence. When I was about 25 or 6, hmm. I'm going to say 24, um, probably 98, 1999, somewhere in there. Um, I was gay bashed. I was gay bashed by two men with baseball bats who ambushed me while I was walking late at night. And it's kind of funny for years when I used to tell that story, um, I would, for some reason, I always told that story and be like, but don't worry. It wasn't really, they only hit me twice. And then I ran away. So don't worry, the baseball bat, I was only struck four times with a baseball bat. There were two of them and each of them only hit me twice. To minimize the abuser dynamic, to somehow be like, oh, don't worry, you know, at least I wasn't dead. It was no big deal. And to like minimize that in myself. But that's not even the whole point. That's more like the, the hetero supremacist in my head, if that makes sense, or the, the sort of, the expectation that um, you're going to pretend it didn't hurt to take away the power of your abuser. I just had that epiphany right now. That part was new. Anyway, um, I wanted to live you, let you see that window in because it's going to come back in a minute. So let me just look at my thing here. 
right? Because what we're talking about is the way that, you, and, and, and I'm not special by any means for having lived through like these terrible acts of violence. A lot of us have, um, you know, whether it's psychological abuse, physical abuse, um, you know, just this, the, the financial abuse that we suffer, um, in a system that, you know, blames us for failing, um, while it actually has constructed itself to ensure that we never succeed. Um, all of that abuse and suffering is swirling around and, and, and we all are kind of taking it in all the time. And, um, it comes back. It comes back in moments that have nothing to do with the original abuse or that are only tangentially related to it. So it's difficult to like weave the threads back to it. Right. Um, and so think about that. Let's just imagine that we're in an activist space or, Oh, let's not even imagine. Let's just take an example that really happened. That is happening right now. Before I go there, let me finish this thought though. What is a conflict resolution team supposed to do when I be like, oh, well, you see, my dad did this thing to me when I was eight. Okay, what do you want us to do about that? This is a conflict resolution team that's, that's dealing with this thing here, and you're telling me it's rooted back in these other things. Like, that's real and valid. And that pain like exists, but also you need to talk to your dad about that, right? Maybe see a therapist. Um, but when we present ourselves into activist spaces, spaces that are engaged in conflict inherently as a matter of like what we're doing, the enemy we're facing, right? Um, the terrible consequences that we know from the, the, you know, struggle over food, money, power, and safety. Um, we know what we're getting into. I know full well, but if I don't unpack my own trauma, not only for me personally, it can lead to addiction, but now I see it can lead to lashing out. It can lead to impulsive behaviors. It can lead to harm that isn't inflicted out of malevolence at all. And in fact, is even understandable, but yet is also just making it worse. So, wow, I almost feel like <laughs> I, I made the whole point right there. Um, content warning here, I am gonna introduce the, like, the immediate conflict in place. I'm going to try to be as general as possible because I don't want to like, I'm not trying to like fight that conflict here. Um, I'm not going to name names because if you don't know these people, it's not my job to poison your opinion of them because people change all the time. And I want to make space for people to change. Um, and so, yeah, that's the content warning. Um, Oh yeah. So like if, if I do start to get emotional or whatever, you might see me pause and look down. I'm literally praying. Um, and if I feel myself really getting swept up, I'm just going to change the subject and, and finish my talk. So if that happens, um, we're fine. Um, so the essentially, and this is important with the bottom unity and I will, by the way, come back all the way to bottom unity and why this justice awareness and doing this internal work is 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 related to um, all of that. So, um, just bear with me. So, what what happened is that um, we're in a space where a lot of right and left libertarians who are coming from a lot of different point of views exist, and there's this underlying dynamic in the U.S. political system right now, where uh, right wing populism is kind of piggybacking on you know, ordinary conservatism. A lot of the rhetoric used by fascist organizers is very similar, right? It, it's very easy for um, tropes that are incredibly problematic and that are actually building blocks of the fascist worldview 
to uh, masquerade as standard right-wing content. Now, if you're steeped in left libertarian analysis, then you'll know that that isn't a coincidence. And in fact, um, helping right-wing libertarians become aware of the similarity, why the similarity exists and how to be vigilant um, so that that similarity doesn't um, open up a door to the wrong kind of wrong. Let me rephrase. I'm, this is about justice. We're not going to judge people, but um, to a dangerous state of mind, entering into libertarian spaces and turning them into something that they shouldn't be. Something that is not the full beauty of a, of a libertarian world set free. I'll put it that way. Um, and we call that the far right pipeline. So what's going on right now is that a, a, a pretty well loved figure in um, libertarian spaces um, has a page that a lot of people watch and some of the content that one of its admins or more of its admins, but at least one that we know of um, is kind of picking up some of the content that's floating around in right wing circles that is actually um, it's connected to a fascist worldview. I just, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's QAnon. It's all of that. And it's getting posted on a libertarian page. And so <clears throat> And the spirit of bot immunity and the and spirit of anti-fascism. Um, we brought that to the attention of the party as a whole. And inadvertently, um, I mistook a piece of evidence I found to be pointing to a particular admin that it was, well, I guess I can't call it evidence because it was, a wrong conclusion. So a piece of false evidence that I jumped to a conclusion a step too far and I rushed it out and I put it out on my page before I fact checked it. Um, and it blew up because the particular person involved, there's a history where um, way back in the day, like some chats occurred and some problematic speech was revealed and, and, and it was never resolved. And, and so, so it blew up and, and I only say all that because I had a trauma reaction. Like I literally had a trauma reaction because the people were coming into the comments and some of them were the same people from those chats. And the reason I told the stories I told is not because I need sympathy and not even because I think they absolve me. Um, I tell them because I want to like put a spotlight on how like understandable things can be and yet still like flip around and make it even worse. And if you're in my circles, you know what happened. If you're not in my circles, you can probably imagine, right? Because we all know, just think of what happens when, you know, somebody comes out and, um, you know, explains that they were raped by a well-known celebrity and they begin to, you know, the gaslighting comes out and they're blaming the victim and all of those kinds of things happen. So here's where I'm going to just, I'm just going to pivot to pivot bot immunity because I feel like the example, you know, the example, you heard the example, that's, that's what happened. Um, because what's going to happen when you get left and right libertarians together and you try to work on simultaneously just working together, but also doing accountability work to separate what is really the bottom right from the top right in disguise. And I mean, just to be fair and balanced, um, you know, the top left does circulate in this whole like left unity kind of space and there is a little of that but we don't normally have much of a problem with that there isn't really like a top left communist pipeline in the same way that there is a pre-existing far right pipeline right so that was the paleo strategy that existed for a long time and that's why the libertarian party has this poor reputation and why it's so vulnerable right now right so um 
the far right pipeline ends up being a target a lot more often, which makes a lot of right libertarians feel personally attacked. And that's just built in to this project. So <sighs> justice, what does justice look like when we're in activist spaces and these things are flaring up in unpredictable moments and there's so much more complicated than any kind of a, you know, um, a judiciary committee or a conflict resolution team. Um, in fellowship, in recovery, we have sponsors. We have another individual that we work with. And when we have things like this that like flare up, we talk to our sponsor about it and we examine that in the light of the spirit, right? Going with that like temptation of Jesus story, we look at it. Are you clamoring here for resources? Are you clamoring here for status or safety or comfort, right? Think about that. What is an apology for that even supposed to do? Like I get the political function, an apology for, um, you know, steamrolling someone's trauma that will absolutely be healing in the way that it legitimizes that hate speech is actually wrong. Hate violence is actually wrong. Gaslighting a victim is actually wrong. But also when that apology, if it is ever posted, how is that going to relieve me of the responsibility to unpack the connection, for example, between the way I triumphed over my father and the way I refused without even realizing, I guess I was refusing to let go of the trauma from my gay bashing. Right? So justice is bigger and more local. And by local, I don't mean just a democratically controlled restorative justice, you know, entity in my neighborhood. I mean, inside me, that's where this has to occur because look what it led to. And again, this is not to let anyone else off the hook for the fact that like there's stuff on their side of the street, right? Because there is, right? But there is stuff on my side of the street too. And that's why we ask ourselves, what was my part in this? What was my part in this? How is it that I was in the desert being offered a shortcut to, you know, safety and, and, and whatever. And I took the temptation then saying, no, I refuse to let that temptation lead to a giant system of harm, even though we're, none of us are here to build a giant system of harm, but as long as the cop, the capitalist, the gay basher is living in our heads, it's still with us, right? So I was impulsive. I impulsively acted when those people were commenting in my thread. That happened. I failed to be patient. This person is caught up in an unexpected drama just like me. Maybe a week from now, they will realize that a public apology would be good PR at the very least, right? I mistook the fact that demanding an apology could equal justice. And I was unforgiving and cruel to people who look up to me. So this is kind of like risky to kind of put this out in a transparent way, because when we're doing this work, optics matter, right? Reputation matters. The way you frame things matters, right? Most political organizers, politicians, whatever you call them, they don't make public statements about how wrong they were and how deeply wrong they were. And um, that can be used as a weapon again all over. Um, but the reason I wanted to go through that exercise today openly is like, for one thing, I realized earlier in the week, shit, you need to do like a deep fourth step around this because holy shit. <laughs> Uh, but like, I was so swept up in it that, um, like I was doing work in the moment. Like I was, I don't know, but like, I didn't have time to like, I need to get away from this for like 12 hours and sit down with my journal and fucking unpack it. Right. Um, which is really 
not just a lesson for me, but it's a lesson. I won't say for you because it's not my job to judge whether anybody else needs to get out on a journal and do a bunch of unpacking. But what I hope by letting it be like transparent is that you could be maybe inspired to see how, if that resonates with you, um, it could dramatically accelerate our potential for success, if that makes sense, right? Because let's just say we had restorative justice processes. We would still be like stalled out where I carry it to the committee and they're like, okay, were you ever abused? Oh my God, you're right. My dad spanked me. We don't have time for me to do that at Epiphany. I'm glad I already like did 75% of it so that it's even there. Um, and in the same token, um, I don't have to, like, we don't have to wait for that. I can sit down with my journal today and do that. And so can everybody else. And if we know we're engaged in a struggle against an enemy that is far more powerful with far more resources, um, far more organized than we are, um, at least for me, I like to take a page of responsibility for that. Like I am responsible for um, trying to be as efficient as I can with what few resources I have. Um, and that includes my capacity um, for being healing, um, for not just talking about justice, but like manifesting it. So here I want to pause because I owe Logan an amends. I owe several people an amends. Um, and I'll be working through that over the next few days. But um, Logan, I told you that I would run your social media. You asked me for help. You got a late start on it. You needed someone. And I was on hiatus from social media at the time. And it ended up that I knew that I needed to tap into my audience to really amplify this uh, festival. And it's another one of those understandable things, right? I hadn't been logged into my social media for months. And um, so it's fine. I needed a way to get in and make another splash or whatever it is. Um, and not even that making a splash was a motive as much as just seeing what everybody was up to um, and kind of, you know, not just being there to like use my audience for attention, but like for one, stepping back and, and not seeing them as an audience, but rather other human beings who want to live in a world set free, just like I do. And therefore don't just use us, you know, as a, as a target for spam, but like actually get on the field and fight with us. Um, so that was actually a really, um, a really healthy state of mind for me. But the side effect was I got swept up in this damn thing. <laughs> Fuck. So Logan, I am so sorry that I let you down. Um, I didn't post nearly as often as I should have. And that is a consequence of this. So I owe you an amends. And if there's any way I can make our relationship right, please let me know. So there's that. So in conclusion, I hope that by providing a transparent window into like how I use principles of, you know, and it doesn't even have to be, you know, a Christian Bible, a story about Lent, you know, whatever scripture matters to you. It, it can be any other faith system. It doesn't have to be a faith system at all. It can be therapy. It can be new age, um, you know, inspirational content. It could simply be journaling. Um, you know, it could be self-help YouTubes. It can be whatever, um, but my hope and my my prayer for my fellow activists is that we can recognize the connection between like the harm that the system we're fighting against has inflicted on us and the way we carry that harm around in our hearts. Um, it requires a, a, as much work to in, unpack on the inside as it's going to take to dismantle on the outside. And in fact, dismantling it on the inside is a, is, a, is a key component of how we do that. <sighs> I 
feel like I, I really summarized that point well. So I'm going to move into my conclusion. Um, like I said, I'll be back to do a panel this afternoon, a little bit later with some of the other members of the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. Um, the far right is surging in the Libertarian Party. The moderates are mistaking far right content. The I mean, pretty much the moderate and the radical right both are mistaking this conservative content for just standard content, and it's not. Um, and there's a significant amount of labor to um, explain how it's not. And I want to be clear here because Logan mentioned earlier that like I was moving away from the party per se and like intellectually I am, I'm still not like claiming like membership per se. I am a life member. So you're on their list forever. That's kind of where it's at. Um, I no longer believe electoral politics will, will ever set us free, even as a harm reduction measure. Um, I'm looking at this purely for the fact that like, um, QAnon, again, Donald Trump, it's a fairly, it is the third largest party in the most powerful nation in the world, but it's still pretty weak. It would be pretty, that's why, that's why the Mises caucus is having a pretty easy time, a relatively easy time, you know, scaring everyone <laughs> because they, they seem to be fueling a pretty big amount of growth. Um, but what if Donald Trump, winds up getting shut down by their establishment and he's he's looking for a way for his QAnon, you know, it, this party would fall like that. And who knows what would happen then? So I really, really strongly like the anti-fascist benefit of this work. Like if I could drive anything home to you, it is that. And that is an anarchist impulse um, to do anti-fascist work like that. And it properly belongs in um, the, the headspace of anarchist praxis. So if even that is enough for, um, you to feel inspired by this work, um, the right wing members of the party are not as unreasonable as, um, the reputation of the party would make you think. And moreover, a lot of them, like, the more they hear about like the difference between mutual aid and charity, the more it becomes an active desire to participate in mutual aid because charity is like, Oh, it's something you do when you have a little bit of extra money, but like mutual aid is something you do from the love in your heart. And um, like it, it brings you joy. Like it's genuinely joyful. And like, I think the human spirit like knows that instinctively. I think that like, that's one of the truths that's written in our heart to take a scriptural reference. Right. Um, and so like, there's so much power to like expand and simultaneously, like prevent any kind of a fascist, like at least take that gun off the table, like I said before, but also to like gain strength. Um, so that it's kind of like, now we've got an electoral, at least, um, like block on the table. Um, that is connected to anarchist spaces doing mutual aid work. So for example, when the time comes to like a great example in Phoenix is um, they're doing a needle exchange, but giving needles is technically um, there's technically a law against it. So the greater, like there's a connection there and like an awareness, like uh, that we, Hey, it'd be a good idea if you uh, work to abolish this law. Oh my gosh, that's great. We have, a trust connection with people who can get that done. Um, yeah. The uh, final thing I want to say is there's another thread to Lent. So the first is that idea that there were 40 days of temptation. The other one is that the end, other end of that uh, time period is Easter, which is, essentially when the church and state conspired to murder an innocent man. And um, there's a pretty dark sense of like, can you imagine knowing that that was what was going to happen, that that was what you were walking towards and you chose to continue going among the people, teaching, feeding, and healing anyway, 
because that is what was right. And I think that uh, kind of metaphor is really helpful for us too, because we don't know where this is going. We do live in a time of right-wing populism. And there is a sense of like something hanging over us that like we hope that we're able to overcome and maybe avoid, but that might not be possible. So for me, it creates a sense of urgency um, to recognize that um, as I'm doing this work and trying to get it done as, as quickly as possible, try to avoid enacting new harm as much as I can and to be forgiving when, you know, my fellows fall short of that. Even if I'm not able to do it right away, even if it takes a week that I do do it, um, there's kind of like an inspiration there that like teaching, feeding and healing, building a world that's built on love for each other, mutual aid. Um, it is so important for us to do that no matter how frightening the potential risks are. And I'm going to close with that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Mikester. And, you know, I mean, uh, uh, as to what you were saying earlier, I, I expect things to happen in people's lives. This is an anarchist festival. We're trying to throw things together and we're working with human beings and we treat them like human beings, not, you know, cogs in a machine. So we love you, Mikester. I love you too. Aww. So, anyways, on next, we have um, Spooky from the Center for Stateless Society. Um, as Mikester mentioned before, tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central, we will be starting the Coup de Gras Day 3 live stream with a panel that Mikester and I are doing on Christian anarchism. So definitely join us for that if that is something that interests you. Afterwards, there will be a panel on egoist anarchism that includes a, uh, a fun little assortment of folks. So including James Weeks, my brother, Jeffrey Novator, and a bunch of others. Um, you know, stay tuned. After Spooky, we have, you know, a wonderful, um, just absolutely amazing lineup, including podcast titles are Spook, um, Reality Winners Mother is coming to talk about her case, and the campaign to free her as a political prisoner. And then Mike Stur will be returning for the Libertarian Socialist Caucus panel. So that's what we have for the next three panels in store. We will be going until 10 p.m. Check out our merch store on our website, coudegras.wtf. And I will uh, switch over on Spooky. Thank you again, Mike Stur. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.